Hey, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for our next speaker. Uh, my name is Will McClellan, and I'm feeling really fortunate I'm not the next speaker because uh, <laughs> what an incredibly tough act to follow Ian is. Um, but hey, that's Agile NZ. The quality is high, that's why you're here. And I know that our next speaker is well up for the challenge. Uh, we've been having a bit of a chat, and this guy's done everything from scrum training to coaching to certified professional and working with Elaborate uh, over in Australia. Uh, I think he's, he's seen a lot and done a lot, and in the light of Richard's talk, think, uh, sorry, Ian's talk, uh, thinking about tomorrow, I know that uh, Erwin van der Koch is a man who definitely spends most of his time thinking about tomorrow and seeing what he can do to get us there. So please welcome Erwin. Good afternoon. Um, seven habits of highly effective organizations. Uh, but I want to start out with this warning. Uh, I've been giving this talk a few times, um, and it can be very sort of discomforting for a lot of people to realize that they're working for a uh, highly ineffective company. Um, so you've been warned. But this question has been in my mind for a while. Sort of, what has Agile achieved? What have we done? Seriously. And this is, this is hard. Right? This is a community I've spent 10, 15 years sort of building, helping, spending thousands of dollars going to conferences, speaking. But what have we done? What have we really achieved? Right? Maybe if we fixed IT departments. And I'll, 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 I won't get into that particular argument. But have we fixed organizations? Yahoo, big success story, early 2000s. They're doing agile with tens if not hundreds of teams uh, across of Yahoo. They haven't really taken over the market, have they? You remember these guys? Yeah, huge success story, early 2000s. Hundreds of teams doing agile. Here's the um, share price of one of Australia's prized agile public company and six of its peers. You get absolutely no points for guessing which is theirs. So to answer that question, have we fixed organizations with agile? The answer is, well, not always. So what is a highly effective organization? How do, we, how do we get there? And I think one of the most important things is that our organizations are sort of prepared for the realities of the 21st century. Is anyone going to get that? Cool. All right. Prepared for the reality of the 21st century. But what are those? How is the 21st century very different than the last? And I think there's two major things that are related in making things worse. It's a massive increase in uncertainty, in unpredictability, and most of all, complexity. And I really want to dive into that next word, complexity, because we use it interchangeably with complicated, or as they mean, two very, very different things. Um, I always use uh, game and analogies. And Complicated is like chess. The things to do in chess is predicting the future. The player with chess who predicts the future better than the other one wins. It's about analyzing, thinking hard. Whereas if you think about playing poker, that same strategy gets you absolutely nowhere. If you look at you, your two cards, playing Texas Hold Them, there's no amount of thinking that will tell you anything about your opponent's cards, except that he doesn't have these two exact cards, obviously. So what we have to do in poker, which is very different than chess, is learn. We try things. We make a bet, and we see how someone reacts. We call them names. 
We tell them they know what, what, what their cards are and see how they react. The name of the game in poker is learning. And that's what we should be doing a lot more of. So a complex environment is one where cause and effect are obviously only in hindsight, with unpredictable emergent outcomes. Yeah. Cause and effect are not obvious until after the fact, which means we should be doing and trying a lot of things and see what happens. Um, and we get these unpredictable and emergent outcomes. Um, who was here was in Bradley Scott's talk earlier today, where he talked about sort of giving pods, the teams, the power to sort of um, build up and split. And I loved how he talked about how two teams, sort of three teams, went, uh, this isn't working, we need to merge. Which is one of those emergent things that they could never have thought of. They didn't, they didn't it happens. And that's what we need to see a lot more in of our organizations. We need to go from scaling efficiency to scalable learning. And this, by the way, is the slide where you guys go, ah. Oh. Good, thank you. All right. One metaphor I use for our current organizations is an egg. Um, eggs are some of the most robust structures you can find. Um, go home, grab an egg, and try to squeeze it in your hand. You won't be able to do it. Right? Try and squeeze it between your, your, your palms of your hands. You will not be able to squeeze an egg. They are extremely robust against known forces. Falling out of an egg, uh, falling out of a chicken, and a chicken sitting on top of it. You can put a 40 kilo chicken on an egg before it breaks. But if something unexpected happens, like the edge of a bowl, it very, very quickly breaks. And that's what a lot of our organizations are these days. Um, I talked about rob robustness, and what we're looking for is Something that a lot of people think robust and agile are uh, fragile. Sorry, I've been too agile, I guess. Um, some people think fragile and robust are sort of the opposite side of the spectrum. And it wasn't until very recently a uh, writer called um, Nicholas Taleb, Nicholas Taleb uh, coined the term, term anti fragile. Anti fragile is something that instead of breaking under stress, improves with stress. So robust is just less agile, less fragile. Doing it again. So robust is less fragile. Anti-fragile is where we get better. Now, this is the MRSA bacteria. It's completely resistant to all known antibiotics, precisely because we've tried to kill it with all known antibiotics. How do we get to organizations that get better under stress? Now, who here has heard about Chaos Monkey? Oh, I'm not good. Quite a few people. Um, who here works for a company that has a disaster recovery plan for their IT infrastructure? I'm glad that's most of you guys. Um, who here works for a company that tests that in production? Nice. Cool. That's a lot more than a couple years ago. Um, what Netflix realized a couple years ago is that their infrastructure became way too complex to plan for. Right? There's no way they could predict all possible failure modes and what their reaction would be. So they wrote Chaos Monkey. Chaos Monkey is a piece of software that randomly goes around and kills infrastructure components. It'll kill server processes, load balancers, entire servers, everything. And whenever something bad happens, they go, oh, we didn't see that one coming. Let's go and fix that. 
the only competitive advantage left in the 21st century is adaptability. And we need that kind of thinking, in not just in our infrastructure, but in our entire organizations. Now, the future is already here. It's just not very evenly distributed. There are tons of companies doing amazing stuff in this space. We, we just sort of talked about Ian uh, and his company. It's way ahead of what other companies are doing. Um, so I'll be talking about the seven habits of highly effective organizations, and we'll give you a bunch of examples. Now, all of these companies do all of them very well. Um, I'll just pick out one per habit. So seven habits, th three categories. The first one is people. Um, trust people. Now, everyone trusts their employees, right? Everyone is trusted? Yeah, pretty much, yeah. So you, do you get to decide where you work, when you work, how you work, with whom you work, on what you work? Do you have a company credit card? Well, why not? Because you're not trusted to either be able to or want to make the right decisions. It's that simple. Valve, gaming company in the US. Um, they're a private company. They don't disclose their figures, but um, they're rumored to be one of the most profitable businesses per employee. And um, they have one big problem. It takes new people, new to the company, about six months before they realize that there's no one there to tell them what to do. So they've created the Valve Employee Handbook. Who's read this? Oh, good. If you haven't, go read this. It's absolutely amazing. Um, a fearless adventure in knowing what to do when there's no one there to tell you. And my favorite quote from this Valve Handbook um, is the glossary entry for Gabe Newell, the owner. His glossary entry is, of all the people at Valve who are not your boss, Gabe Newell is the most not your boss. <laughs> and I know it's easy to go, oh yes, these are software developers, and it's easy to do with software developers. They are highly educated, highly motivated people. Um, which is why you should look at Morningstar. Morningstar is a, one of the largest tomato processors in California. And they do this with thousands of employees who are seasonal or factory workers. No management. Everyone gets to decide what to work on, how to work on, with whom to work on it, um, and spend whatever money they need. Although I'm not sure they sort of bought a quarter million of dollars of, sort of TVs. But that's how they do it. Um, if you're the reading type, um, three amazing um, books on this particular subject. Um, I'll be doing this, sort of give you three um, suggestions to read after each habit. Um, the slides are online, you shouldn't sort of have to scribble them down really quickly. Number one, trust people. Number two that I want to talk about is not just tolerate, but embrace failure. Right. Here's some experts on failing. Thomas Edison, I haven't failed. I've just found 10,000 ways that won't work. Michael Jordan, 26 times I've been trusted to take the game-winning shot and missed. I failed over and over and over again, and that's why I succeed. Or Albert Einstein, anyone who's never made a mistake has never tried anything new. So how does this work in our organizations, where we want to have these in sort of innovative, um, initiative-taking people, yet we punish failure? 
not going to happen. It's not going to work. Um, Spotify gets this. Um, Spotify is a company that trusts their people. Um, so when they wanted to implement a uh, bonus scheme, they couldn't do the top-down managers assigns your bonus. So what they did was they went like, ah, we should have everyone in the company sort of give out tiny bonuses to everyone else. Sounded like a cool thing to do. So they did. They tried it, and it failed miserably. Because the guys working on the cool new features in the iPhone, they got all of the uh, bonuses, and some guy watching log files in the basement got absolutely nothing. So HR did what any good HR department did, and they treated the entire office to cake to celebrate that they learned that this particular um, bonus scheme doesn't work for Spotify. And they've institutionalized this. Spotify offices have a fail wall. This is an actual photo of the Spotify fail wall where they put up stuff that didn't work and what they learned from it. And that's what most important is. How do we make more mistakes that don't kill us? That's the trick. So here's three books on why you want to fail and some really interesting ways to do it. So number three, the organization as a whole. What do we have? Be brutally honest with yourself. Does anyone know what this is? Yes, indeed. This is the first ever digital camera. That was invented by Eastman Kodak in 1975. More than 20 years before the commercial introduction of digital cameras, 30 years before they were commercially viable, Kodak had invented the thing that was going to kill them later. But they could never, ever get themselves to bat on it commercially. They spent millions of dollars in research, which is the only reason they're still alive, is because they have tons of patents in this area. They could never get themselves to commit to it commercially. They could never be honest with themselves. Now, everyone knows about this battle. Um, and how that went. Um, the only interesting thing here is I recently found out that um, Netflix offered themselves to Blockbuster for 50 million bucks. They're now worth 35 and a half billion. Um, that would have been a cool investment. Um, but they didn't. But this is not the battle I find interesting. This battle is much more interesting. The battle between the Netflix that was mailing out DVDs. Um, uh, DVDs are those the <laughs> silver round things. Um, the Netflix that's mailed out DVDs and the streaming side of Netflix. The battle between Netflix and Blockbuster also went on in Netflix themselves, internally. But they were able to see where the business was going. They were able to make that bet and go streaming. They did this interesting thing. They realized that they needed to focus on the streaming side of things, so they tried to get rid of the um, mailing business. They rebranded the Quickster and said, sort of you guys go over there and we'll do the streaming side. Huge customer backlash. Absolutely massive customer backlash. So here's the CEO, Reed Hastings, going, uh, we like to go really fast at Netflix, um, but sometimes we go too fast. And they reversed the decision. 
So it probably cost them millions to do, to sort of make the split. And then he spent another couple million reversing it. So now there's Netflix and Netflix. Be brutally honest with yourself. Number four. Number four is autonomy at all levels, which I think is one of those um, sort of silver bullets. If you're looking for the silver bullet um, organizational performance, this is it. It's too bad that if you're the type that looks for silver bullets, you won't be able to do that. Um, autonomy at all levels. Um, it, he might not look like it, but this guy, um, Moltke the Elder, um, is the foremost expert on 21st century management thinking. Seriously. Um, he lived in the 18, late sort of 1800s, and some interesting things happened during that time. He was a military man, and warfare quite radically changed in his lifetime from a fairly static um, battles where we could sort of commanders oversaw the entire battlefield and sort of gave orders. That completely disappeared um, in his lifetime, um, mainly to this technological advantage of, called the rifle. Now, rifles were interesting because they allowed much, they could shoot much further than muskets. That meant that now defenders had a great advantage over um, attackers, because before that, it was basically two armies who ran at each other, and the first one to run away lost. This radically changed warfare. Armies got larger, more spread out, um, and the traditional commander gives orders style didn't work anymore. So he invented, uh, so actually, no, I want to go to one of the most amazing quotes I've ever come across. Um, the first bit of it is, the tactical result of an engagement forms the basis for new strategic decisions. This is a guy in 1862 who realized that you do not roll out strategies. Who here has been the victim of a strategic rollout? Yeah. Right. Stuff that happens on the technical level, operational level, should inform new strategic decisions. And that's why what he did is he invented this whole military doctrine, a doctrine called uh, Auftragstaktik, which is translated as sort of mission command. And he had this radical, radical notion. Instead of telling people what to do, we tell them what we want to have them accomplished. The only sad thing about this is that it's today, it's still very radical. So autonomy at all levels. Um, now, this is what a lot of people sort of think, that on the one hand we have autonomy, and on the other hand we have alignment. Keep doing this wrong? Yes, I'm doing it right this time. Autonomy, alignment. But this is not what it is. This is not the case. What Moltke realized is that high alignment enables high autonomy. So, if you're in sort of high alignment, low autonomy, you're in a command and control type organizations. We need to cross the water, build the bridge. Whereas if we're in the sort of high autonomy, low alignment, the more startup culture, it's very much the, gee, I hope someone's working on that river problem. Whereas this is the sweet spot. It always is, and as a consultant, I'll, I'll tell you that. Is if there's a two by two matrix, it's always the top right. It's the right one and the most expensive one. Um, but yeah, high alignment enables high autonomy. We need to cross the water, figure out how. Now, one company that really, really gets that is uh, a company called Svenska Handelsbank. 
Svenska Handelsbank is a big, big Swedish bank. Uh, it's got offices all over the world. Um, and it's one of the best banks in the world. So you look at the top whatever of banks, you'll see Handelsbank in the top 10, top 20. It's one of the most efficient banks in the world. It's one of the most profitable banks in the world. And it's got the most loyal customers. They've won best Swedish bank um, sort of for the voted by consumers 26 years in a row. That's pretty darn impressive. But they've got no budgets. They've got no sales targets. They've got no bonuses. They've got no matrix structures. Um, and they have a grand total of three levels of management. There's the board, there's regional managers, and there's branch managers. And that's it. And it's all because of this guy, Gil Nolander, in the 1970s. Uh, his motto was, the branch is the bank. So branch managers in Svenskansbanke have almost all of the autonomy to make decisions. They decide what customers to target, how to target them, how to market them, which products to sell them, which loans to approve and not to approve. All of it is done on the branch manager level. Autonomy at all levels. If you read three books, um, skim through this one, because it's really hard to read. Um, these two absolutely amazing. So number five, and I, I love um, Ian's question at the end. Um, would you go over 30 people? Go, hell no. The thing is to think big, but stay small. Kodak, at the height of their power, um, had a market capitalization of about a 30 billion. 150,000 employees. Instagram, when it was sold for a billion, had 11. WhatsApp, sold for 19 billion, had 55 employees. You don't need to be big to make a big impact. Stay small, think big. Um, but you don't have to stay tiny. This is uh, Bill Gore and his wife. Uh, they started W. L. Gore and Associates. They're the company behind Gore-Tex um, and about two and a half million other products. They do everything from military medicine, um, electrical, medical, everything. Huge company. Um, but one thing, something really frightening happened. Bill got into the office, and he ran into this guy he didn't know, who turned out to be an employee. And that freaked him out, as it should. How the hell are we going to scale the company if we lose touch of the most important relationships? And he made a decision at that time that no department could be more than 150 people. So if any department gets to more than 150, they split up and go find another place and something else to work on. And I'll, I'll, I'll give you exhibit A. This is a picture of the, one of the campuses. Um, and we'll see two office buildings. If you sort of take the time to count the amount of parking spaces, you'll find it's just under 130. Nothing, no organization gets bigger than 130, 140. So here's a question. What do gorillas and Christmas cards have in common? No? Hmm? Yes, very good. They were both studied by Robert Denham. Um, now, Robert Denham, Denham was an uh, anthropologist. 
He was an anthrop anthropologist uh, who studied primates. And one of the things he was fascinated by is the group size of primates. Um, it is very consistent within a species, but is wildly different across species. So the same type of primate will have the same group size, but there's huge differences between different species. And he tried every possible hypothesis he could come up with, um, and only one stuck. And that was the size of their um, prefrontal cortex. <coughs> so I'm like, this is cool, this is interesting. Um, I've got all this research about sort of primates and prefrontal cortexes and group size. What would that, what would that group size be for humans. Um, so he plugged in the numbers and outrolled numbers sort of about 150. <coughs> so how was he going to test this? He, he partnered up with the uh, British Post in the early 90s when we still send postcards. Um, sort of figure out how many postcards the average person sent and received. Um, and it was indeed just shy of 150. Now, 150 is the amount of people we can have a meaningful relationship with. <coughs> that we know their names, whether they have kids, what their interests are, up to 150 in our entire social life. So you want your organizations, if you want that collaboration and that interaction, you want to make sure they're well below that number. Some really good stuff on sort of staying small, thinking big. So here we go. Third category is the what you do. The first one is simplify all of the things. Um, who here works for a company that has a uh, travel expense policy? Yeah, very few. Uh, has anyone actually read one? Like everything. Yeah. Ah, so. Um, Stet Oil had this really big problem. They're a, an oil and gas company in Norwegian one, and um, that meant everyone was traveling a lot, and their travel expenses had gone out of control. So they instituted rule after rule after rule, what you could and you couldn't expense, and the number didn't really budge all that much. Until finally someone had enough and said, screw this, fuck it. No more rules. You can expense anything you want. We'll just put everything up on the internet. You want to guess what happened? Yeah. Expense, expenses plummeted. Yeah. Simple rules, complex behavior. This is interesting. Um, Missing two slides. Um, but sort of the biggest comeback in corporate history was the comeback of Apple. Right? When Steve Jobs got back to Apple, Apple had dozens and dozens of, pro of product lines. And he cut them all. His whole thing, and he's so there's matrix, there's consumers, and there's laptops and desktops. So he killed the printers, he killed the cameras, he killed everything but four models of computer. Simplify everything. Your products, your processes, um, and there's very few companies that get this uh, better than Buurtzorg. Michael talked about it in his keynote for a minute. Um, but this is an extremely interesting organization that has eight to 9,000 nurses in about 800 teams. Now, the thing I find very interesting is that these 8,000 nurses are supported by 45 staff. That's it. These are 800 highly autonomous teams who get to do what's needed to give the best possible care to their clients. That's the only thing they do. 
caring for clients. All the rest is bullshit. They've got one manager who's the CEO. Um, a guy came called uh, Jos de Bloch. Um, and they only have a manager because they're by law required to have one. Um, now, there's an interesting story about uh, Frederick Leloup, the um, writer of Reinventing Organizations, the, the book they talked about this morning. Uh, he was going to do an interview with Jos. Um, so he sort of got in touch with him and um, asked him if he had sort of half an hour of his time. And sure, you said, come on up. We'll have a chat. So they did. Um, Frederick prepared all of his questions carefully and asked all of them. And when the 30 minutes were up, they sort of had this nice little chat afterwards, which lasted for about four and a half hours. And at one point, Frederick goes like, well, you're a CEO of a sort of couple hundred billion dollar company. Don't you have better things to do? And Yost goes, well, what? Nah. Everything's fine. Don't worry about it. His thing is about guarding the culture and the vision for the company. It's the only thing he does. Right? By simplifying everything and doing all of the other things I was talking about, um, there's very little for him to do. Very little decisions for him to make. It's not a real cool stuff. Which brings us to our last point, uh, but certainly not the least, which is relentless customer focus. Now, here's a little bit, a bit of a Q&A. Um, the question is, who are typical customers of Facebook? Everyone is one answer. Is anyone else sitting else? Shout something out. Yes. You were my talk on Agile Australia, weren't you? <laughs> Advertisers are Facebook's customers. So what does that make us? The product. And Facebook knows this. Now, Facebook knows very well who their customers are. And it's not us. But it's very, very important to get across who your customers are. And here's the thing. The business are not your customers. A customer is never in the same building as you are. It's never in the same organization. Bank tellers aren't your customers. Customer support people aren't your customers. The account managers out there aren't your customers. And the business sure as hell isn't your customer. Who is paying you good money for goods or services that your organization provides? Those are your customers. Yet we don't get to talk to many of them. In fact, it's almost impossible to get to them in regular organizations. But really good organizations have this really well done. Um, one company I want to talk about is Zeppos, um, arguably one of the most customer-centric organizations um, around. Um, there's some really cool stories about Zeppos, but the one I like best is um, their customer support center. If you go into any sort of call center, um, you'll find KPIs around thing. And it's, you, there's usually a KPI in there, sort of call resolution time. It goes by a bunch of different names. Uh, but it's basically, how quickly do you get rid of a customer? And depending on the industry you're in, that's sort of two to five minutes. The record customer support call at Zeppos uh, is a little over nine hours. Hours, not nine minutes. The only thing Zeppos cares about is how happy the customer are when they hang up. 
It's the only thing that counts. And that's what's important. Relentless customer focus. Um, Zeppel stories, certainly the cultural side of things, is uh, delivering happiness. Really well done. Um, so here we are. This is it. Trust people, embrace failure, be brutally honest, create autonomy at all levels, think big, stay small, simplify all of the things, and relentless customer focus. So if we sort of bring all of that together, what are we talking about? We're talking about the 21st century organization is a decentralized network of autonomous, cross-functional teams um, who self-organize around a customer. Wait a minute. Did you say cross-functional, self-organizing, team, focused on a customer? Isn't that agile? Yes, we are all experts in 21st century management thinking. Our friend Steve Dunning calls Agile sort of the best kept management secret on the planet. And we all have a choice to make. Do you want to scale the Agile process in the IT department? Or do you want to join us and bring management thinking into the 21st century? Thank you very much. Pretty much like the. I think we've got a few minutes for questions. I'm not sure if we've got other mics around the room, otherwise, I'll have to throw it. Uh, but hands up those who would like to ask a question. Let me just chuck that one up, because it's got the sort of slides if you want to look them up. Any questions? There we go, down at the front. Any questions? Hello. Yep. Uh, can you give us an example, just of the third point that you talked about, be brutally honest with yourself? Sort of, an example of brutally honest? Yeah, yeah. Um, so the, the Netflix one. Um, that I talked about. So they were brutally honest with themselves. Uh, we weren't going to be uh, making a lot of money mailing out DVDs in the near future. We have to do this streaming thing. Um, it's not, you don't nearly see enough. There's a lot of examples where people weren't brutally honest with themselves. Uh, but there's few examples. Um, I'm trying to, does anyone else have an example? A company that sort of took this bold new step. Startups do it all the time, but it's fairly a lot easier for startups. Um, there's a lot in the startup space. So Groupon that started out as a sort of social protesting site and um, PayPal as a thing. But established companies, it's very, very hard being brutally honest with yourself because you've got so much invested in the status quo. Um, it doesn't happen nearly enough. Sort of Gillette? I'll look into it. Um, apparently, Gillette is something to, um, to look into it. Um, but yeah. Any other questions? You guys love asking questions, don't you? Yeah? No? Last chance? Three, two, one. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Evan.